This video is a speed run of the first topic in Year 13 A-Level in Organic Chemistry. It's intended as a final prep before an end of topic test or your actual A-Level exams, so see the rest of the channel for some more detail. Period 3 are the third row of the periodic table, and the eight elements listed in this period all have three shells, so their electron configuration ends with either 3s or 3p. The general trend across the period is that atomic radius decreases because all the atoms have the same number of shells and therefore shielding, but there's a higher nuclear charge and therefore there's a stronger electrostatic attraction between the positive nucleus and the negative electrons in the outer shell. The first ionisation energy increases as we move left to right across the period due to the increase in strength of the electrostatic force between the nucleus, where we're adding an additional proton each time, and the outer shell electron, with the exceptions of aluminium, which has its highest energy electron in the 3p subshell rather than the 3s subshell where it was for magnesium, and sulphur, where for the first time we have two electrons sharing a 3p orbital and therefore repelling one another more strongly than the unpaired electrons. The differences in melting point as we look at the period can be explained by their structure and bonding. Sodium, magnesium and aluminium have metallic bonding, and this requires a relatively large amount of energy to overcome, and so therefore these metallic elements have relatively high melting points. Magnesium and aluminium have higher melting points than sodium because they have more outer shell electrons and also a higher charge on the cations, and both of these contribute to a stronger electrostatic force of attraction. Silicon has a very high melting point indeed because it forms a giant covalent structure. Phosphorus, sulphur, chlorine and argon have comparatively low melting points because these are held together only by weak van der Waals forces. But also we can see that sulphur as the largest molecule has the highest melting point of those four as it has the most electrons and therefore the strongest van der Waals forces followed by phosphorus, P4, followed by chlorine, Cl2, with monatomic argon being the lowest. The first year 13 content is about the reactions of sodium and magnesium with water. Sodium reacts very vigorously with even cold water to make sodium hydroxide, which is an alkali, which turns universal indicator blue, and also a large amount of hydrogen gas, which we can demonstrate by igniting it and listening for that characteristic squeaky pop. In contrast to this, magnesium reacts very slowly with cold water. It undergoes the same process, making magnesium hydroxide and hydrogen gas, but you're unlikely to see more than a few very small bubbles. Gradually over time, if you watch a solution that's had an indicator added to it, it will slightly change colour. However, if you react magnesium with steam rather than cold water, this is a much more vigorous reaction, and it also forms a different product, making magnesium oxide rather than magnesium hydroxide. We also see a bright white light and that magnesium oxide is a white solid. You need to know the formulae of the period 3 oxides and the observations as they form. Sodium is extremely reactive and reacts with oxygen even when it's cold, but if you do burn sodium in oxygen it burns with a yellow flame and produces a white solid with the formula Na2O. Year 7s everywhere love to make magnesium oxide by putting magnesium in a Bunsen burner, so you hopefully remember that this makes a bright white light as it forms and the oxide itself is a white powdery substance. The next few elements all react in similar ways. Aluminium reacts with oxygen at high temperature to produce a bright white light and a powdery aluminium oxide, which looks almost like a white smoke. This is the same extremely corrosion resistant aluminium oxide that coats the outside of anything that's made of aluminium. Silicon also reacts with oxygen, releasing a bright white light, but only at extremely high temperatures and often having to use something like magnesium as a fuse to start the reaction. Phosphorus will also react with oxygen to release a bright white light and a white powdery substance. It's worth noting in particular the formula of phosphorus oxide. Here, phosphorus has an oxidation state of 5, and that might lead you to believe that the formula should be P2O5, but it's not, it's P4O10, because this isn't an empirical formula, it's a molecular one, so this doesn't represent the simplest possible ratio, but the actual number of atoms in the molecule. Then we have sulphur, which can react with oxygen to make either sulphur dioxide or sulphur trioxide. We discussed the importance of structure and bonding for explaining the melting points of the period three elements, and that's also true when we think about their oxides. Sodium oxide is ionic and therefore has a relatively high melting point because it takes a lot of energy to overcome that strong electrostatic force of attraction between the positive sodium ions and the negative oxide ions. 
Magnesium oxide is also ionic, but it has a higher melting point due to the increased charge density of Mg2 plus ions, which are able to more strongly attract the oxide ions, and therefore it requires more energy to overcome that attraction and melt the lattice. Aluminium oxide is ionic, but it does show some covalent character, and this can be explained by the electronegativity difference being less big, or alternatively by the small aluminium ion with a high charge being able to get close to the oxide ion and distorting the oxide charge cloud. Silicon dioxide is a giant covalent structure, and therefore it has a very high melting point due to the large amount of energy required to break the strong covalent bonds. And then our final three oxides are simple molecular structures with much lower melting points because it's only the weak van der Waals forces between the molecules that need to be overcome, not strong covalent bonds. The general rule of thumb is that when metallic oxides dissolve in solution, they form alkalis, whereas non-metallic oxides dissolve to form acids. Sodium oxide and magnesium oxide are both able to act as bronsted lowry bases, accepting protons or hydrogen ions in order to make hydroxides. Sodium hydroxide is more soluble than magnesium hydroxide due to a weaker strong electrostatic force of attraction between the two ions. Therefore, it dissolves more easily and therefore it releases more hydroxide ions. And this leads it to have a higher pH, even if they're the same concentration. And even though magnesium hydroxide is still alkaline. Aluminium oxide and silicon dioxide are basically insoluble, so they don't affect the pH. And then phosphorus oxide and sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide can all dissolve to produce different acids. Phosphoric acid forms when one mole of phosphorus pentoxide reacts with six moles of water. This phosphoric acid can then dissociate in water to form dihydrogen phosphate ions. Sulfur dioxide can react with water to make sulfurous acid with the formula H2SO3, whereas sulfur trioxide can react with water to make the more familiar sulfuric acid. You also need to be able to explain using symbol equations how these acidic oxides react directly with bases, like this phosphorus pentoxide reacting with sodium hydroxide. Now these can be a little bit challenging to remember and I personally find it helpful to imagine that you're dissolving it to make an acid first. So we know that one mole of phosphorus pentoxide will react with six moles of water to make four moles of phosphoric acid. So if I now take those four moles of phosphoric acid, I now have a standard acid alkali reaction where one mole of hydrogen ions combines with one mole of hydroxide ions to make one mole of water. So my phosphoric acid reacts here and we make the salt and also the 12 moles of hydrogen ions and the 12 moles of hydroxide ions, which come together to be water. If we join together this equation with the previous equation, then we're left with something like this. And what we can see now is the six moles of water I added at the start that aren't really supposed to be in the equation are being balanced out by some of the 12 moles of water that I make. So I can just cancel those out and we're left with the final equation in which one mole of phosphorus pentoxide reacts with 12 moles of sodium hydroxide to make four moles of salt and also six moles of water. We can also express this in an ionic equation, which looks a bit like this. The equivalent equations for sulfur dioxide and sulfur trioxide are much more straightforward. One mole of either gas reacts with two moles of sodium hydroxide to make a mole of salt and a mole of water. Sulfur dioxide forms sodium sulfite, or to give it its proper IUPAC name because AQA will, sodium sulfate 4, where the 4 represents the oxidation state of sulfur in the SO3 2 minus ion, and sulfur trioxide forms sodium sulfate or sodium sulfate 6. Again, we can also write ionic equations for each of these in which we skip the sodium spectator ions. You first met silicon dioxide in GCSE chemistry where it was an example of a giant covalent structure or a macromolecule. So you already know that it contains thousands of atoms covalently bonded together. And this makes it very hard, gives it a very high melting point, makes it very unreactive and also makes it almost completely insoluble. However, chemists love to classify things. And so we want to be able to call it either an acidic oxide or a basic oxide. Now, silicon dioxide won't react at all with water or dilute alkali, but it will react with very concentrated alkali. And therefore, we do classify it as an acidic oxide. Aluminium, as ever, is the complicated one. Aluminium oxide is amphoteric, which means that it can act as either an acid or as a base. You need to be able to write symbol equations for aluminium oxide acting in both ways. So to give you an example of it acting as a base, here we have it reacting with hydrochloric acid to make a salt and water. And again, we can write this as an ionic equation if we omit the spectator ions. Then it can also act as an acid. 
So here we have aluminium oxide reacting with sodium hydroxide to make sodium aluminate, which is what was made during the hydroxide precipitation test to identify the cations. And again, we can put that as an ionic equation as well if we omit the spectator ions. Finally, your two basic oxides will both react with an acid in order to make a salt and water. You should be prepared to write a full chemical symbol equation for them reacting with any of the major strong acids or write an ionic equation in which you skip the spectator ions. Thank you for watching and I hope you found this a useful speed run of this first inorganic chemistry topic. If you are finding this useful then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-level chemistry revision resources coming soon.